Um, I think the sort of the general takeaway from my part of the presentation really is that sort of uh, while there is a lot of enthusiasm about the use of ICT towards improving outcomes in education, I think that there is still a lot more that needs to be learned uh, about really how best to introduce ICT uh, in conjunction with all of the other inputs that go into producing learning outcomes uh, in India, for instance. So what I've done over here is I've tried to summarize the evidence uh, based on about uh, nine or ten recent papers that have all used randomized evaluations uh, to look at the effect of ICT or computer assisted learning on r sort of some sort of learning outcomes and I'm summarizing the, le the learning outcomes using standard deviations again as Abhijit mentioned maybe the easiest way to think of this is sort of on a scale from zero to two where zero is sort of the, the worst performing student and two is sort of the best performing student and so uh, you know, uh, a standard deviation improvement of 0.2, for example, is a 10% improvement towards sort of the, the best outcome that you could hope for. Um, so just looking at these nine studies, it's, uh, you know, just bidding them into positive and, and, and negative or zero, we see that they're about evenly split between studies that find sort of positive effects of ICT to studies that find none or even in one, co one case a negative effect of ICT on learning outcomes. Uh, and I'm, what, what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk really is try and talk through some of these results to try and understand really where is it is that we're likely to see positive results and where it is that we're likely to see, say, negative or zero results for ICT. So, and all of this will really revolve around trying to get a better understanding of the particular context in which the ICT was introduced and how it was introduced. And that's going to go a long way towards explaining at least some of the differences in outcomes that we see. One thing that we can see already sort of looking at this uh, laundry list is that a lot of the results that find no or negative effects are actually found in developed countries. So there's a bunch of studies in the US, some, some from Israel, that essentially find that introducing ICT has had basically no effect on learning outcomes, at least as measured by test scores. Um, on the positive side, a lot of the studies that we see here have basically come from India, uh, suggesting that at least in India, and we'll talk about these studies in a little bit more detail, uh, using ICT does, uh, does lead, at least in some cases, to positive outcomes. At the same time, there's also a study from India that actually finds the, the strongest negative outcome for the use of ICT. And part of what I'll do is try and reconcile why that particular study found the negative outcome that it did relative to these studies that uh, actually found reasonably positive outcomes for the use of ICT. Uh, as sort of a summary of you know, looking at these nine studies and trying, if I were to try and summarize what we think we've learned from these nine studies, I think um, one clear bit of evidence that seems to, uh, that seems to matter, maybe it's, you know, it's sort of uh, obvious exposed, is sort of how the program is implemented seems to matter a lot. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about some studies that actually tried to vary how the program was implemented, and we'll get some sense of the importance of the implementation of the program by looking at that variation. Um, the other sort of uh, useful bit of information from these studies suggests that sort of technology perhaps is most effective uh, when it's interactive and when it's targeted at the level of learning of the student. Okay, again, this might be something that I think ex post is, is reasonable, but we'll see in some of the uh, studies that found negative of no effects, these te technology wasn't quite introduced in this, in this particular fashion. Um, and then finally, something I think that certainly, you know, in the Bay Area gets, inc gets ignored a lot is this idea that even if technology is effective, it's not always clear that it's cost effective. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, interventions that looked at the cost effectiveness of a particular technology. So I tried to answer the question, you know, for a given improvement or for a given increase in learning, um, what is the cost of that improvement if it was done through ICT versus what is the cost of that improvement? Was it done to something else, whether it was done through hiring teachers or changing some other input into the production process? Um, so I'm going to start by talking about uh, a couple of specific papers that are mostly going to be all based in India and talk a little bit about the context in which the study was done, what the study found, and sort of what we think we might be able to take away from it. Um, so this is a study that sort of looked at computer-assisted learning. This was done in uh, Baroda, and this was uh, done essentially by using pre-existing computers that already existed in these schools, and the uh, intervention worked with Pratham in essentially training uh, people in the community who then basically trained students to be able to use these computers to basically use, use them for you know, playing education games. And this was about uh, a two hours a week intervention in which about one hour was replacing school time and one hour was sort of done after school time. 
Um, so this study is, uh, as I was sort of on my leftmost column of studies that I summarized. Uh, study found test score increases about 0.35 in the first year, about 0.47 in the second year. So these are, if you think about 0.45, uh, so that's you know based on a on a uh, on a maximum of two. So that's a substantial improvement in learning outcomes um, for this particular intervention. And one thing that this study was able to point out that actually the nice thing about this was that students were able to progress at their own pace. Um, so this is a study that sort of found reasonably positive outcomes uh, for the introduced for the introduction of computers uh, aimed at improving math learning. Uh, just as an aside, I think that so the researchers went back and they found actually that the improvements had, had declined somewhat a year after the program. So this is something else I think that, uh, uh, as the researchers point out, that's something that's worth exploring is thinking about the long-term effects of, of ICT themselves rather than sort of just the effect during the program. Um, so that was one uh, paper that found positive effects. This is a, this is a nice study because uh, it sort of varied things along multiple dimensions. It, Firstly, it sort of changed, uh, it looked at two different ways of, two different technologies, if you like, of, of improving learning. And then it also used two different methods of implementing the technology. So it had a nice design, you, you had two different technologies, so to speak, and you had two different ways of providing the technology. So if you like, you had this sort of two by two grid where you could tell, you know, what was the effect of changing the way in which you provided the technology, what was the effect of that on test scores, versus also just comparing two alternative ways of providing the same kind of education. Um, so what was this project? So this was a project that was done in about 340 schools in Maharashtra, and this was a project aimed at getting kids to speak to improve their English. Uh, the first kind of technology this uh, project used was something called a PicTalk machine, which is very similar to these um, leapfrog type technologies that are common today. Essentially, these are sort of, uh, this, is a plus, this is sort of a glossy book within a plastic shell that has a stylus that when pointed at uh, particular objects on the, on the page will say the word aloud. And so the idea is that this is going to help people, uh, this is going to help kids improve their vocabulary. So that was one kind of technology to, to help kids improve English. Um, the other was uh, the use of activity flashcards. So these were about 400 flashcards that had, that was meant to convey the same kinds of information that was conveyed using these uh, leapfrog type technologies. Um, and what the researchers did again was they were able to uh, assign the schools to schools that just received the machines, just, just received these uh, PicTalk machines, uh, schools that just received the flashcards, and then schools that received both the machines and the flashcards. And in these schools, the kids alternated which days they used the flashcards versus which, which days they used the, uh, the leapfrog machines. Um, so that was the two different kinds of technology, if you like. Uh, they also varied the way in which this technology was provided to the kids. Uh, in particular, they varied who provided this instruction or who provided the use of, who sort of supervised the use of this technology. So in the first year, this technology was essentially implemented by assistants that were externally hired and trained by the researchers themselves. Um, and in the second year, this technology was then implemented instead by basically training the teachers who already existed in the schools. Um, and it trained them to sort of use this technology. So we can see the effect of the technology itself, and we can also see uh, the details of the implementation of the technology and whether that seemed to matter for the results as well. So in terms of uh, sort of the broad takeaway, uh, the study first found that whichever way you look at it, sort of if you remember this little two by two grid that had sort of the technologies and how it was implemented on, on, each, on the rows and the columns, the test score sort of improved no matter which treatment you looked at. They went up by about 0.2 to 0.35 standard deviations. Um, and so in general, it seemed like this was an effective way of, of improving learning outcomes for kids. Um, the interesting thing that the study found was that it seemed like the strongest students really were the ones who seemed to benefit more from the sort of more self-directed, self-paced machines, whereas the sort of the students who were weaker before the start of the program were the ones that seemed to benefit more from the teacher-directed flashcard activities. So uh, I don't think there's a consensus in this literature about which way this, this, this goes. The, the previous study in Baroda found evidence that went the other way, uh, but I think there's, there, seems, there seems to be at least agreement that there's heterogeneity in how kids, different kids responding differently to the same, to the same technology. Um, the other study, the other result that was actually very interesting here was that it turned out that even though this was a intervention that was aimed at improving English, 
when this intervention was offered through the teachers themselves, when the teachers were trained to offer it, it also ended up improving math scores. Uh, so that was interesting, and I think that sort of the, the, the story that comes out of this is that the teachers actually, once the, the, the regular teachers actually spent less time on English uh, once, they were, once they were actually responsible for using, for using say, the PicTalk machines, um, essentially having covered the material in English with the more efficiently with these machines, they were then able to at least switch to teaching more math. So it, or at least the results are consistent with sort of uh, the teachers optimizing along this dimension, and therefore you see an improvement not just in uh, English scores, but also in math scores. And so I highlight this mostly as a way of sort of highlighting the fact that the details, in terms of the details that, that you actually use to implement the technology, often end up being quite important for the, for the kind of outcomes you care about. Uh, so the other, the other thing that comes, comes up in these studies, if you read the papers, is it's, it's striking sort of how often the studies will mention that sort of uh, the context and implementation seems to matter a lot. And again, this is something that, 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 that's not uh, rocket science, but I think that uh, it, it does matter, although on the other hand, there doesn't seem to be uh, sort of a, a con conclusive evidence suggesting uh, which are the contexts in which it's always successful. So for instance, one big issue in this entire literature is um, how exactly or where exactly and when exactly should uh, this sort of ICT be offered. And so one issue is, uh, you know, should it be offered as a replacement for, say, classroom in time activity or should it be offered as a supplement? You know, should it, be, should it replace class time or should it be an add-on to class time, maybe by having kids come in after school or before school starts? Um, so there was a program that was run in Western India that was basically in Gujarat um, that looked at exactly this dimension. It, it was a randomized controlled trial that varied when students received uh, the ICT instruction. So a certain set of students received it after school, whereas some of them it actually replaced in school time. Um, and what they found was that actually uh, the program that replaced school time actually led to reduced test scores. So that was the negative figure that I found in the second, that I pointed out in the second slide. So essentially, when you replace school time, teacher time with this ICT, uh, students did worse as a result. Uh, whereas when this was a program that was added on to the curriculum, so when kids came after school to actually uh, do the program, you had a positive effect. So that was sort of striking evidence that really the details seemed to matter a lot. But of course, sort of, uh, again, context mattered here. This was a program that was introduced in um, 60 schools that were run very well by an NGO called Gyan Shala. And the teachers, are, on average, were actually quite good in these schools. Uh, and so what seemed to be happening, at least in this context, was that reasonably skilled teachers were being replaced by ICT. And so therefore, perhaps isn't that surprising that the ICT results, when you replace those teachers, uh, were worse, certainly, than the results you would get if you, if you sort of supplemented what these teachers were already doing, perhaps fairly well in the classrooms, with sort of after-school activities designed to complement what they were learning in class. Um, on the other hand, uh, another program uh, in Baroda found that at least replacing some classroom time with a computer-assisted program had a positive effect. Um, so I think that sort of the, the, the overall message from these studies is not particularly which, you know, when things work or not, but really that it's really important to think about all of the other inputs that go into producing learning when you are thinking of adding ICT into the mix. So there's a whole bunch of other things that contribute towards student learning, um, and ICT can the, the introduction of ICT can interact quite differently depending on the levels of those other inputs. And this is something I think, again, that uh, we need sort of lots more evidence on. Uh, I, so another thing that I think is sort of, uh, you know, seems very obvious when you think about it, but this idea of being able to sort of integrate technology into the lesson plan, I think, is something that is often ignored in, in many contexts, and there are studies that actually document this. So the, the idea is that essentially technology needs to sort of be fully integrated into the lesson plans and sort of teachers need to be trained not just into using the technology but also uh, sort of getting kids to use the technology. And so this is uh, an RCT that was done in Colombia that was looked at sort of a, a very expensive government program that provided computers to, uh, tons of computers to schools and that in fact did spend a lot of time training teachers as well. So it was an eight-month eight uh, teacher training program. Um, 
Um, so, you know, looking at it from the ex-ante perspective, it seems sort of reasonable. On the other hand, the program found that there was absolutely no effect on test scores at all. So this was a program that was designed to improve uh, Spanish language learning, and they found no effect on Spanish language test scores. They also found no effect on math scores. Uh, the only place where the computers really were used more in class was in computer science class, where you know kids were using computers anyway. Um, and so this just points out the idea that it's actually it's important to be able to integrate ICT into what the teacher is already doing, um, and also highlights the difficulty of actually doing that. Um, and you know, I, personally, I, I can attest to that. So uh, you know, the the the, the Center for Technology and Learning uh, at my university is constantly trying to get me to use uh, clickers and all these sort of uh, technological innovations that I'm sure would improve my teaching, but I have just no idea how to integrate them into the way I've set up my lectures, and as a result, I, I don't use them. Uh, but I think that this is the, the question of how exactly to, to integrate this into a teacher's leaning, uh, teaching plan, I think, is important and something that, that clearly in this, exp in this particular study was ignored. Uh, so, so far I've talked mostly about uh, introducing technology in schools. Uh, more recently, there's been lots of enthusiasm around using technology at home. So things like the One Laptop Per Child program um, and other programs that are sort of trying to stress the importance of, imp uh, of introducing kids to technology at home and the consequent improvement or the hypothesized improvement in, in say, learning outcomes as a result. Um, and here again, the, the results are very mixed about the effects of these kinds of programs. Um, so I'll talk a little bit first about this pro about an evaluation of the one laptop per child program that you know, has received tons of publicity. Um, basically, this randomized evaluation that was done in Peru found that the, it was done, I think, in about uh, 309, kids going to about 319 schools, so it was a reasonably large RCT found essentially no effect on either math scores or language scores. So basically, uh, giving kids these, these laptops re really had very little effect on uh, their math scores, very little effect on language test scores. It had some mildly positive effects on cognitive, on cognitive skills um, as measured by various kind of uh, Raven's matrices type tests designed to sort of uh, test people's thinking abilities, but really no effect on, absolute, on, on learning. Um, and again, if you read the paper, it sort of makes sense because, you know, essentially uh, the kids were completely unsupervised as when they used these computers. So it's not surprising that you find kids, in fact, once they got these computers, spent less time on homework, uh, spent less time on reading, um, and they did also spend less time watching TV uh, and spend more time on the computer. But it's not surprising that essentially if you, you know, uh, having kids myself, if you leave kids unsupervised in front of a computer, you know, improved math scores and improved uh, language scores are not the first thing that, that will happen. Uh, and in fact, they did find that parents who actually supervised what their kids did with the laptop uh, did actually see some improvements or at least didn't see, the, the, uh, did see some positive effects of, of having the laptop. So this is again uh, sort of another way of saying that the way in which the technology is implemented at home is clearly going to matter for the kind of outcomes that you care about. And if you care about learning outcomes, then just sort of giving kids laptops with very little supervision or instruction is not going to generate uh, the kind of outcomes that, that you think are important. Um, similarly, um, this is an example. This is a, the, actually the only non-randomized control trial uh, in my review. is a study in Romania uh, in which essentially um, the Romanian government handed out vouchers that subsidized the purchase of computers for low-income households. Um, and the researchers here, again, find results very similar to the, uh, to the Peru study. They find you know, there was some improvement in cognitive skills. Uh, you know, kids were sort of more computer fluent as well. But basically, there was, in fact, negative effects on language and math scores. And again, uh, the, the sort of explanation is that this was essentially unsupervised provision of, of computers to kids. And not surprisingly, it, it didn't generate particularly uh, striking results as far as learning outcomes were concerned. So that's sort of as far as looking at the um, effects on pure learning outcomes. Um, there's a separate issue that I think is, is important, which is thinking about the cost effectiveness of these interventions. So even if you think about you know, the five or six studies that generated positive effects for the ICT intervention, there's a second question that's useful to ask, which is you know, for a given um, improvement in learning outcomes of say you know, 0.1 or 0.2 standard deviations, what is the cheapest way that you can achieve that improvement uh, 
in learning outcomes. Uh, and here again, uh, it's not always clear that using ICT or computer assisted learning is really the cheapest way to generate that improvement in learning outcomes. Now there might be other reasons to think about ICT, whether it's wanting you know, children to be more fluent in computers or something like that, uh, but really a lot of the motivation for these programs comes from sort of improved learning outcomes. And once you take that metric, then it's no longer clear that uh, CAL programs are really the cheapest way to achieve that given improvement in learning outcomes. So for example, um, one of the programs I talked about earlier is remember the one that, uh, that generated the negative results if you give kids, uh, if you replace school time for kids with computer time. Um, that program generated positive results when you, when you had it as an add-on program, but did so at a cost that was substantially larger, say you know, three to four dollars for a given increase in health out in education outcomes relative to say a remedial tutoring program that was tested in, uh, in Baroda, which basically got you uh, the same improvement in learning outcomes uh, at a fraction of the price. Right? So this is similar again to uh, another program in uh, an English teacher training program that also generated improvements in learning outcomes, again at a fraction of the price uh, as the ones that were generated by uh, the computer assisted program. So I think this is something that's, that's very useful to sort of keep in mind because uh, even, uh, even when you look at just the programs that were effective, uh, there's a big variation in the kind of uh, interventions that can generate the same effect for you. So this is sort of uh, a description in words of that graph that Abhijit put up in the beginning that sort of says that there's a big variation even for so generating the same improvement in learning outcomes. And with ICT, I think we sort of know uh, even, even less in terms of the, the evidence base for, for this going forward. Um, so something else that haven't, that you know, I've focused mostly on sort of the introduction of computers or things like that. Um, it's important to point out, and I think Sridham will point, talk about this a lot more, that uh, uh, ICT is really a lot more, lot more than just computers, or a lot more than just in, introducing computers into the learning process. And there are lots of uh, innovative ways to use uh, sort of ICT to improve learning outcomes. Um, and I think that some of these have, have been tried out. There's a lot more that haven't been tried out. But for example, there was a, a, an RCT that essentially uh, improved teacher attendance uh, by basically making teachers photograph themselves with their students twice a day. Um, and uh, this, they, you know, using a, using a digital camera. And essentially found that absence rates halved from about 40% to 20%. Um, and you know, just getting teachers to show up then effectively also improves st students' test scores by about 0.2 standard deviations. So about 10% of the way towards sort of what you might think of as, as the best you can do. And again, so this is sort of a very creative use of ICT, um, improve and, and just generate you know, improvements in learning outcomes. Um, there's a whole bunch of other uh, studies that sort of do things that are very similar. Um, so the, the program in Ghana that basically distributed uh, about 600 Kindles to, to students um, and found uh, improvements in test scores. Uh, but then again, it's interesting to, to, to look at this study because one of the things they realized was that actually uh, Kindles break all the time. And so about 40, 40 to 45 percent of these Kindles actually broke during the course of the program. So while yes, you know, it did generate improvements in, in you know, the number of books kids read, um, it, uh, it, it improved their scores on, on reading exams. Uh, it was also expensive because you had, you had a bunch of Kindles that you needed to fix. But this is just saying that there's a whole bunch of uh, other innovations out there that are, I think, useful to experiment with and that hopefully we'll see more of going forward. Um, so to sort of summarize, uh, you know, I think that one of the things that I think is important to point out that really uh, ICT isn't, at least so far, based on the limited evidence base we have, it hasn't turned out to be the panacea for education uh, that its most enthusiastic proponents would probably uh, wish it to be. Uh, at the same time, certainly in developing countries, it suggests that it actually can be a beneficial tool for improving learning outcomes. Uh, and certainly when it's provided in a context where it's provided sort of interactively um, and where it's provided in a way that can be tailored to uh, individual students' learning levels, um, it certainly has been shown to generate some positive outcomes. Uh, but as usual, sort of the details of the implementation matter a lot. So I think uh, in sort of all of these things, um, in all of these studies, what comes across very clearly is sort of the precise manner in which the experiment is, 
the precise manner in which the intervention is implemented uh, can have actually large consequences for, for outcomes. Um, so some of the issues that I think have come up uh, that are useful to think about uh, sort of going forward, one is uh, this thing we, talk, we talked about earlier, which is sort of the difficulty of, uh, of integrating technology into the curriculum uh, in a way that sort of uh, ensures that teachers end up using it versus teachers just end up ignoring it and sort of the computer just lies in the classroom gathering dust. Uh, and I think the issue here is you know, providing teachers sufficient training, not just in using the technology themselves, but in also sort of how to use that technology, how to get st to students to use that technology and incorporating it within sort of their curriculum. And the other issue, which is um, we talked about in terms of effectiveness, uh, it's really sort of we need to think much more, uh, s much harder about the other inputs that, go that are going into generating learning and thinking about how ICT is going to interact with those other inputs. Um, so for example, one of the conclusions from these studies is that in general, uh, if what the ICT is replacing is relatively poor quality teaching, then in those contexts you could reasonably expect IC to have a ICT to have a positive con uh, impact. On the other hand, uh, when the quality of teaching is actually quite high, then replacing relatively high quality teaching by uh, by perhaps a not ve a very well thought out ICT is not going to generate uh, the kinds of uh, impacts that are going to be quite positive. And I think that uh, to some extent um, this explains the difference between the, the zero findings in most developed countries um, and the somewhat more positive findings that we see in India and some other developing countries. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, just sort of to, as a lead up to what Sriram is going to talk about, there's, there's lots of room for innovation here. I think we are very much at the beginning of trying to understand how we can use ICT to improve learning outcomes more generally and early grade reading more specifically. Um, there are lots of, I think, issues that need to be ironed out that I think going forward are going to be useful to, to examine more carefully. You know, where should the ICT, should we add this onto previously existing school hours? Should it be replacing school hours? Um, you know, should we be training teachers to do this um, uh, in addition to the regular teaching? Should we th or should we be thinking about implementing it externally? Um, and I think recognizing that the same intervention can have a very different impact on students, uh, on different types of students, and sort of trying to target ICT uh, to the appropriate level, I think is something that uh, we need to learn a lot more about. And I think uh, sort of just as a, a, as a caveat, I think that one thing that uh, hopefully we'll pay a lot more attention to going forward is thinking really about the cost effectiveness of these technologies. Um, as I pointed out really in, in, in a lot of cases it turns out that even if ICT is very effective in terms of generating learning outcomes, it does so at a cost uh, that you know, is much higher than something that's you know, comparably easier to provide in certain contexts. So I think uh, to the extent that we are, we are measuring outcomes by sort of learning outcomes as, as test scores in those kinds of contexts, I think there are other kinds of interventions that can, that can lead you to have uh, the same kind of outcomes, uh, but perhaps more cheaply. Uh, you could make the case for looking at other kinds of outcomes, but I think in order to do that, I think we need to design studies that are designed specifically look, to look at those particular outcomes. I think in general, I think what we ultimately do care about is not just test scores. I think we care, we want sort of we want to see how people do in life as a result of this, so we probably care about labor market outcomes and earnings and things like that going forward, and I certainly think that's something uh, we should hopefully be studying uh, in the longer term. So I think that's, uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Abhijit. Uh, thank you, Abhijit, for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, I'm here to, uh, to talk about a practitioner's view, but before I start, I'm going to quote um, Abhijit Banerjee this morning from the, uh, from the Hindustan Times. And it says, the, the broader point is not at all that new technologies never work or that the poor cannot adapt to them. There might even be one already somewhere that does work. But it does remind us that technology works best when it sits lightly on the lives of its users. And most importantly, it warns us not to declare victory too soon the fact that we think something should work is not enough. It needs to work for the people who use them. So on that note, um, I'm going to start talking about something that has worked a little bit, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about something that did not work, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Um, so uh, before I do this, uh, you all know of the famous j study. We keep talking about it, Esther's work on um, improving um, 
teacher attendance using cameras. Uh, Aperture just mentioned it. There's also a work by Karthik, which um, all of you might also know, which says that um, contract teachers or para teachers, temporary teachers, um, are equally effective as uh, as permanent teachers. And what you find um, is at this point is um, people don't think about this enough because the the cost of a of a permanent teacher, as Abhijit mentioned this morning, is 200,000 plus plus. I mean, it's training, keeping them happy, and then putting up with all that stuff. And the cost of a contract teacher or a parent teacher, in, at least in Hyderabad, uh, that we saw is about 3,000 rupees, if that. And you can get a volunteer, as they call them, uh, for less than that. So it's less than minimum wage, and they would work. And they're equally effective. So you can get five or six parent teachers for, for one uh, uh, contract teacher. So we took that thesis and we said, uh, well, you know, we know teachers don't show up. And you can monitor all you want, but what ends up happening is, you know, we have, I don't know if you know in Hyderabad, for example, you have uh, 28 days is the official leave that women get. Uh, and then you have sick leaves and you have all the other leaves, and it comes to about 40, 45 days a year. So you, you know they, want, they don't need to show up 20, 25% of the time. And so what we said was, look, in, in that event, you need to still have a teacher at some point. So the thesis was that, was that any teacher is better than no teacher. So we used, um, we tried to use a simple technology inter intervention. We said, you know, all of you have used cabs before. You call on a cab and you say you want a cab. And the, what, the, what the company does is it, it pages all the cabs on the, on the street and says, look, uh, you know, Sri Ram needs a ride, and who is nearest to this address is going to show up, right? So you take a similar, techno similar concept, apply it here. But you use something that you all understand. And you know, in India, we all understand cell phones and we all understand SMS. And hopefully, teachers can read SMS. Uh, and that's, that's the hope. So we don't need to worry about their reading skills. And so what we do basically then is that we built this technology that allowed us to page teachers in the area which says, look, there's this classroom without a teacher, and if anybody you want to fill in to the, uh, and teach that particular class, then they can come in. Um, so that's, that's what we try to do. But um, so technology works. It's, uh, it's fantastic. It's easy. Uh, it's universe. It's everybody gets it. Uh, there's no problem with breaking it down. But then there are a lot of process challenges. So <laughs> one of the big problems in India, as you know, is we need to have paperwork. So how do you demonstrate paperwork that you actually call this person and that person showed up? And so you need to have trail and track of this, which is uh, not possible you know, when you do an SMS, because it's instant, people show up. So we're trying to figure that out. And the other thing that we have problem in India is a lot of people change numbers all the time, because a lot of them are prepaid numbers. So we end up having uh, a bunch of teachers with telephone numbers. They don't update their numbers. And that's like a really hard thing to do, get to keep teachers uh, updating the numbers. And then, you know, you, then the easy thing to say is, you know, can we penalize them if they don't update their numbers? But the problem with that is like, you don't, when you, it's, it's a little late when you know uh, but you no longer know their numbers, and when you catch up to them, they've again changed the numbers. So it's really hard, but I think, I think we'll, we'll, get, we'll get better at it, and I think technology will help us do better. Um, that's kind of what we're trying to do. And then just institutionalizing this within, within um, government and government schools, uh, that's a little hard, but you know, for all of us here who want to scale something like this, I would urge you to look at a problem as simple as monitoring teacher attendance, and actually do it at your, at your location with the technology that exists that people understand, it's easy to implement. Um, because it's, it's very inexpensive, um, it works. Uh, it has some process challenges, but I think if you can figure it out and localize it to your state or your, your county or um, your area, I think, I think we have, uh, it's great possibility for, to solving at least one problem. Um, I'm gonna talk about something that did not work. Um, same state of uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, about four years ago in its infinite wisdom, thought that by buying computers and, and projector and, and a DVD player and all that good stuff, we'll get kids to learn. Um, so what they ended up doing was investing about 100 and some crores. And we don't know what that some crores is, maybe 200, 300 crores, but it's 100 plus crores of money um, contracted to a, to a private agency to supply uh, a large device that was supposed to do many things. It was supposed to uh, be a computer. It was supposed to have a projector, connect to a TV, a DVD writer, all the fancy stuff, and it was supposed to be one fat massive device. And uh, before I tell you what really happened to this project, the really sad thing was we went to visit uh, some such, such schools in Hyderabad, uh, in the slum in Hyderabad. And the sad part of it was the, the school's very small, so it's got three or three and a half, three rooms. And the, the, one of the rooms was occupied by this, this, this thing, and then everybody, nobody used it, so everybody sat outside. The kids were asked to sit outside because that was a computer room, and so nobody really use the classroom, and then people had to sit outside and learn. I'm talking about this because I think it's not, I mean, I don't, I don't have an academic perspective. I have a, you know, like a real life problem. And I think what's really sad is in Hyderabad, it gets pretty hot and dirty. I mean, I don't know if you've been to the streets of Hyderabad. It's not a very, 
uh, it's not a great place. So what ends up happening is that uh, kids really, really struggle in this place. So I can totally understand why you don't want to be sitting in the classroom. I, do, I mean, I, it's like it's such a crappy environment. You know, forget bathrooms and all that. But even sitting in the class is really difficult. So you know, it's, it breaks our heart to see, as as advocates of, te of uh, technology advocates, for us to you know advocate something and then find it sitting in a place doing nothing. Um, you know, and then kids sitting outside. So what we found in this case was that uh, the computer thing did not work. Um, even it did, there wasn't enough software that allowed for it to match with teachers' uh, teaching. So what ended up happening was the curriculum and what was on the computer did not go together. So people tried to use it for a bit, and then just like what Aprijit said in Stanford, I think this is a little even more challenging task. And so there was training and all the stuff, but then people didn't want to use it because it wasn't an easy way to, to teach children. It didn't, it didn't offer any help or aid. Uh, it just sat there. And then there was all the additional things that added on later training and maintenance and all this stuff. And then the end of it was just a huge waste of money. Um, and it's really sad because at that point, you then you think that our oh, technology doesn't work, and so we shouldn't ever do this. So that was the initial reaction. So then we had a bunch of problems uh, in the state for the state to even think about, again, buying computers because they said, oh, we tried this. We spent a lot of money. It didn't work, so, so computers are a bad thing. So it's, it's one of those things that uh, I would actually, as an advocate of technology, I would say we, we ought to be careful because it's easy for us to go you know, one extreme to the other. And, um, and also, obviously, it didn't help kids to learn hands-on. Uh, so it's just total failure. But that's, this is how we do things in India. We just, when we like something, we just make a, make a big bid. We buy it. I mean, I, just as a practitioner, to give you a sense, I'm, I'm, not, I'm sure state governments are here. And a lot of them, what happens is that uh, when they like something, uh, we don't want to evaluate it because we're scared. We're afraid of the results. And the second thing is we don't trust the results. So what we then are doing is we, we, then, we then see who's the I'm sorry, but who's the sleekest salesperson who can come and explain to you why this technology will work? And then the government works with agencies like us, like private companies, and tell them, look, why don't you put up this uh, request for proposal? We'll put it out there. We do it. Then we, we, make the, we make it as complex as possible so that only a few of us can bid. Mac massive bill. Government pays it out. Things don't work. And then we'll start again, and the next government comes in. So this is kind of how we spend money on technology. And I'm a bit, uh, it's a pretty sad thing. And I, I hope, I hope uh, for all of us sitting here, um, we learn lessons from, from what JPAL does, and we're able to apply that and, and be, take a cautious approach. And I'm going to just talk about two other quick things. One is, you know, when you're buying so much of technology, you ought to be slightly careful uh, because it's easy, to, it's easy to spend on a lot of things. And I'm going to just quickly talk about what to look out for. One is uh, just being aware of the cost because there are a lot of hidden costs when you buy technology because it just is not just the device. And, and what you find is cost of training, maintenance, upgrade, software. All this stuff gets added up, and none of us understand the total cost of owning this, this device or this technology piece. And a lot of people who end up buying it don't appreciate that. And so what you end up doing is just investing in a lot of, lot of technology, um, which you don't, you'll never use. And the other thing that you find is, um, um, is that the vendors don't really sit with you along the way. So one of the things that we've tried to do, um, I'll just give you a sense of the project was, and it's not exactly education, but we're trying to do this. We're trying to buy uh, fingerprint devices for schools where teachers would then put their fingerprint. Um, and the idea was to use um, UID, which is, uh, as a lot of you know in India, is this new gold standard for, unique identif for uniquely identifying every person. Uh, but there were some, UID wasn't ready, but the idea was that we'd have this technology device, people put their fingerprint, we'll know a teacher came to school. Um, the challenge with this was just buying a device was easy. I mean, you can go to China and buy it for $20 or less. Uh, the real problem was to maintain this, in, and, and like the Kindles in, in Ghana, you might have problems with these breaking. So what, we've, what we managed to convince some vendors is to say, you know, stick with us. We'll pay you per impression. So we won't buy, you won't, we won't buy the device from you. So we'll pay you, you know, if you have, or every time a teacher comes and she put, he or he puts her thumb print, then that's one impression. So we'll pay you per impression. So then what ends up happening is they amortize the cost of this device over three years or five years. You're good because if it's used, you pay. If it's not used, you don't pay. Uh, it's a little hard sell, but it's very doable these days because everybody's riding the cost curve. It's coming down, so you can certainly push for this kind of stuff. And I would urge you to also think about that kind of financing as opposed to you know plunking a lot of money and then figuring out this is a, uh, a big waste. And the other thing is just scaling. You know, a lot of tech everybody thinks technology means scale because technology itself can scale, but the application of technology may not scale depending on where you use it. And I'm a little skeptical. Uh, to think that because something works somewhere, it's got to work everywhere else. And so you have to adapt it to the local environment. Uh, you'll find that as we go along, each of us um, have tried different things. Uh, some things work in some places, some may not work. So I would say that you know, 
you know, cameras might work in Rajasthan, if you're not working in, in, in Bangalore, SMSs might work in Bangalore. So I think we've got to sort of think about how, what else we can do, uh, but, but be open to, so be agnostic to what you use, but ultimately try to use some technology as a, as a, as a tool to help uh, achieve your goals, but just be uh, open to what else you can do in that environment. And finally, uh, just application, you know, as a, tech, as a technologist, I really come from the view, and I used to come from the view at least, that we have a solution and we're looking for a problem. It's very easy for us to think that way because whatever we do has to work and somehow it's surprising it doesn't work in an environment. And we tend to think of that, um, uh, and that's kind of how we approach it. And I think as all of you who are, who are trying this on the ground, you've got to help us understand that it's got to work the other way. And it's easy for us to get, uh, believe in our own, our own theory of why this should work and this ought to work in an environment. We know it doesn't work, but we still want to sell it because it's easy if you, if you, if you scale. Um, and so I would just say that uh, that's something you've got to be cautious about. Having said all this, I would still, I'm still very optimistic about technology. I don't want to be like, like uh, Kentaro or somebody who says that uh, you know, ICT is bad for, it doesn't work for development. And I'm not sure it's entirely true because um, a lot of the work that, that Microsoft Research, for example, did was all around Microsoft and its PC and, they, and their role started there and ended there. But I think there's a lot of possibilities. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few things which, which we talked about this morning. So, for example, um, Rukmi talked about how do you inform parents about, about the progress of, uh, of children. And I think uh, now here phones can play a, an extraordinary role and uh, mobile phones can play a brilliant role. And I think you're finding it to be pretty easy to, to share the information. And the reason I'm saying that is because um, you'll be surprised, uh, at least in local politics in I'm coming, I come from Bangalore, so in Karnataka, we use telephones as a, as a great way to, to let, tell people about uh, things that, um, that forces you to vote for the other party. So for example, we would say something like, I'm not going to quote names, but one party would say that if the other party comes to power, then the, then the price of diesel would go up, you know, double it or whatever. And, and everybody reads that and kind of believes that. So we've seen uh, huge swings in people's perception of um, uh, as soon as they read an SMS. So I think the point I want to make to you is SMS can be used as a powerful information tool. Um, you can also call in and people can just listen to the message over the phone, which is all available today. It's very inexpensive. It's, you can get it for less than two paisa per call. And so it's very cheap. So, in, so disseminating information through mobile phones is a really, really good way to solve, uh, could, uh, sorry, it could be one way to solve that problem. And the other thing that we talked about was cultural reading. Um, I've seen people use uh, a little, we have this little, I can't remember what it's called, some audio device that basically can store 50, 100. It's like an MP3 player, but with a speaker, 50, 100 storybooks. And you can basically listen to it over and over again. Of course, there is a problem that they may not know how to read early enough. But I think there's a way if they, if they, if they like to listen to stories and if, you know, just like parents are reading to children, I think this is a way for the device to read to children. It can be, it can be passive. It can be just in the background. But I think there is, there is a role for something like this. And I'm not sure there's enough... Um, uh, evidence that this will work, but I think um, I think we ought to be open to thinking about problems like this. And a lot of the stuff can be done. I'm, I don't know if you all are familiar with a with a big um, open source movement called LibriVox. Uh, LibriVox is a is in the is a, has taken all the books that are out of print and they and they have an audio reading of this and it's online. It's fantastic and it's uh, you'll be surprised how many people are using it now because it's a great way to read all the boring stuff in the car. Uh, listen to it and go, and then you're, you're still, and you'll still catch up with, uh, with everyone. I, I would totally recommend all of you to try it. And you'll find it to be uh, a, a really fun, open source way of listening to, to, to great books. And I think that's another way of sort of getting people. And we can, we can, obviously, we've got to go down to early grade reading, but I think this is all, these are all possibilities. Um, we're, and, and like somebody mentioned, low cost tablets, I think that's happening. Uh, we're seeing kids play with stuff. And I'm going to quote uh, a, ga a very popular gamer in the US called Jane McGonigal. She makes fantastic games, uh, but she says that uh, the, I, think the, uh, I think the human race spends about 300 million minutes a day playing Angry Birds, and that will be, uh, so if you pay that for three weeks, that'll be, you, can, you can recreate the entire Wikipedia, and just to give you, that's just one game, and that's not even other games, and it's a fact, and uh, you, can, uh, you can look her up, so, and the reason I bring it up is because kids uh, are just love to play, play games, and I think there's a great way, and I think some of the study shows, if there's a really great way to get people to start learning through games. Um, mobile phones are, are an easy, accessible device today. I would urge you all to think about experiments like that, uh, because I'm seeing that there is more than one way to get them to start reading and learning, 
Um, we're seeing a big technology t shift. Uh, India is catching up with all that. Um, and I'm hopeful that the next wave is not a 10 year or 20 year wave, but it's like the next couple of years, you'll start seeing really co low cost devices, really interesting software that's coming out that allow kids to learn. And if we all participate in this process, um, I'm hopeful technology will have a, a, a serious role to play. If not, if not the, if not the sol sol uh, solution provider, it can definitely be a good aid uh, to solving uh, this problem. So on that note, I will, uh, will take questions. And uh, thank you.